Chapter 24, Buffalo Soldiers. The meet with Danny and Rooster had gone better than expected, but there were still hurdles to clear. Hawk wondered if top gang lieutenants would be able to bring the rank and file along with the program. Bad blood between black and Hispanic gangs was as old as the gangs themselves. Social economics aside, the basic problem was a macho thing. The two groups just didn't like each other. Maybe they'd been victims of a divide and conquer strategy, or maybe it was just about the women. Hogg didn't know the answer, but he knew he had to pull it all together. The bangers weren't trained or disciplined, but their sheer numbers made them a potentially formidable guerrilla force, provided they didn't kill each other first. He thought about the thousands of additional bangers languishing in Central American prisons, El Salvador's prisons with 325% capacity, Guatemala's with 251%, Mexico's 126%. He was concerned that the Hispanic numbers could shift the balance of power, but he couldn't worry about that now. The night of the break-in, somebody had opened all the pod doors. Hawk suspected some of the guards had been threatened or at least bribed. He looked into staff later, but right now he needed to stay ahead of Corpus Christi. The organized calisthenics had to go. Dominoes and hoops had to make a comeback. Things had to return to normal. But normal in prison was chaotic. Dressed in camp issue, Wesley Painter loitered at the edge of the black section of the yard, watching the Spanish shoot hoops. After a few minutes, an errant ball rolled his way. The ball hadn't quite reached the invisible race dividing line before he scooped it up. Instead of throwing it back, he walked away toward the black workout area. At first, the Hispanics only yelled at him, but then he shouted insults at them. As the exchange escalated, Painter taunted, You want it? Come get it! That's all it took. This time, when the shot callers went to the hole, the tremendous show of force Hawk brought to bear kept protests muted. As soon as he could, Hawk made his way to the segregation unit. When the tiny cell door opened, Danny didn't bother to look up. You stuffed me in this lunchbox and got the nerve to ask for a favor? We already had a deal. Yeah, we still got a deal, but it ain't good enough. If this thing's gonna work, we gotta do more than just stop eating. We gotta work together. I told you to get your shit together, and you ignored me. Now you want me to go begging? I was wrong. I didn't see this coming, and now I'm playing catch up. But that doesn't change the fact that you're the only man who can fix this. Your people know you have the honorary rose and Reyes's blessing. Danny offered a disgruntled grimace in reply. Hawk was undeterred. You cool with everybody. Nobody got a beef with you. Not blacks, not Hispanics, nobody. You're not really even carnal. You're like neutral. If you suggest a co-op, neither side is actually bowing down to the other. You like Switzerland, a neutral ambassador. Bullshit, I'm Mexican, period. You're asking Mexicans to humble ourselves to Not blacks. bullshit. I'm black. I'm coming to you, ain't I? Why can't the blacks ask for the peace? Blacks ain't got nobody like you. Nobody neutral. You looking at the only black man in the whole system who ain't representing. Like I said, you kind of free agent. Blacks ain't got nobody like that. So, I'm special. Danny's smirk caused Hawk to drop all pretense at diplomacy. No other way around it. We either hang together or we hang separately. Uh, what? I, I know you do didn't say Yes, that. I did, because it's true. Weren't you the one telling me about missing nuts? Bottom line, the government would probably kill us both anyway. Why should we help them? <sighs> Listen, man, we agree, but I can't risk splitting my own ranks, trying to force them to do something that they don't want to do. What? Boy, you might know about code, but you don't know shit about command. Those are your soldiers. They do what you tell them to. You can't be afraid to tell them. I don't know if I want to tell them. Yeah, well, we ain't got the luxury of time, so I know you'll do the right thing. Without we stick together, we ain't got a chance. You make sure they see that. Hawk promised to release Danny from segregation and call for the guard. He needed to leave before Danny started arguing again. When he got to Rooster's cell, he told a skeptical gangster that he was speaking for Danny. Rooster was intrigued by Hawk's shift in philosophies. Shit, nigga. I heard you was the biggest Uncle Tom ever got off the plantation. How you Nat Turner all of a sudden? Hawk took exception to both characterizations. Fuck you, he thought, but said instead. Think what you want. I ain't no Tom or Nat Turner either. His eyes turned uncharacteristically dark. 
and it ain't no all of a sudden. Rooster's sympathetic nod conveyed his casual acceptance, and since all he had to do was agree to peace, he did. The next morning, with the rest of the camp still locked down, representatives of both gangs met in an isolated conference room. The identical mix of delegates was equally represented on both sides. Seasoned OGs who'd served more time than some others had lived sat next to new breeds who were less disciplined, less traditional, but no less ride or die. Hawk noticed Danny getting a weak reception from the Hispanic delegation. He suspected it was due to Danny's lack of street cred. The bangers knew he spoke for Reyes, but what had Danny done personally? He could tell by the blacks' body language they were getting hinky over the Hispanics' reticence. If the Mexicans didn't trust Danny, why should they? Recognizing how fast things could get out of hand, Hawk stood up. Lifting his arms to get their attention, he raised a boisterous, Let me be clear, and brought the meeting to order. We're not banging no more. This, what we doing, ain't that. He was becoming most comfortable with Hood Hawkins. I'm going to say this once, and I don't expect to speak on it again. We not bloods, crips, black guerrilla family, Mexican mafia, MS-13, Serenos, Nortenos, none of that shit. The second you sat down at this table, you became enemy combatants. That's how the government will see you, and that's how you better see yourselves. Let me explain something else. Why y'all running around here thinking y'all all gangster because y'all killed a couple of motherfuckers? The real gangsters out there killing motherfuckers by the boatload, making moves on cities, countries. That little money y'all killing each other over? They the ones print that shit. It's their picture on that shit. They say what it's worth. And they can change it any time they get ready. Let me tell you what that is. That's gangster. And when those motherfuckers hear that you motherfuckers have banded together to withstand them, they're going to fall all over themselves laughing. He paused, methodically examining their faces before adding. I see a lot of y'all probably agree with him. Whatever. Don't matter. Because when they come for one of us, they are coming for all of us. So, far as cooperation go, Really ain't no choice. He scanned the table again, this time putting his hand on Danny's shoulder. Some of y'all think Danny here a coconut. Brown on the outside, white on the inside. Y'all want to say he ain't Mexican enough to speak for you. Ain't that a bitch. Do you know what you're dealing with? You're dealing with racists. To a racist, ain't no difference between a pale-skinned, college-educated Mexican and a black-ass dropout Mexican. They don't care whether you speak Spanish or if you can't talk at all. To them, you're all Mexican. Whether you come from Guatemala or El Salvador, you're Mexican. And Mexicans ain't shit. That same bullshit go down with black people, too. Some of us talk about being Oreos as opposed to real niggas. It's bullshit. It's called divide and conquer. Set the blacks against the Mexicans, the Mexicans against the blacks, the blacks against the blacks, and so on. But don't fool yourself. To have any chance whatsoever of getting through this, we're going to need some help from white folks. From somewhere in the room came a muffled, <coughs> still timing. Refusing the challenge, Hawk continued. Don't get it twisted. They ain't fighting for us. They fighting for themselves. They putting everything on the line for what they believe in, because that's what they do. What about you? And ask yourself this. How anybody else going to trust us if we can't trust each other? Now, if Reyes thought Danny here was the right man for the job, who said they know better? Show of hands. When no hands moved, Hawk abruptly announced, we putting an end to this bullshit right now. Pointing to a young Hispanic, he snapped. Step over here, mister. The heavily tatted kid got up and stood next to Hawk. He pointed to a black gangster and waved him to his other side. Turning to the Hispanic, Hawk asked his name. Nestor. Tyrone answered before Hawk could ask. Okay, Nestor. If Tyrone here say you ain't shit, does that make you ain't shit? Hell no. Exactly. Now, Tyrone, if Nestor here say he fucked your mama, what you gonna do? Tyrone ignored the faint chuckles that rippled around the table, crossed his arms over his chest and tilted his head back. I'm gonna fuck your mama. Hawk raised his hand to silence the laughter. Because he said he fucked your mama. That's right. But he ain't fuck your mama, did he? Hell no. So you know he ain't fuck your mama, but you still ready to die. Can't disrespect me. So when your mama find out that you did, she all right with it, cause why again? Can't disrespect me like that. The hollowness of his words forced Tyrone's eyes to the floor. As the two men returned to their seats, Hawk's dialect changed. Men, we have a situation set inside a circumstance. I'm addressing you as men, he said to the Hispanics. Not border bandits or river niggas. He turned to the blacks. 
or chain draggers or yard apes. Men, because that's what you are. Rule number one, know who you are, collectively and individually, don't matter what nobody else says. The only one who gets to determine who you are is you. Understand something else. We're not heroes. We're not delusional. We're just not taking this shit any longer. But the thing we have to understand most of all is this. We're in this thing together. Your job is to earn the respect of the man sitting across from you. In the meantime, we will treat our brothers in arms as though our lives depended on them. The air was suddenly heavy, and Hawk moved to lighten the mood. Cheer up, fellas. The way I see it, we got some hell of advantages. First, we've been overlooked and underestimated. Plus, we got the element of surprise on our side. Suddenly, Hawk's mood shifted again. I'm not going to bullshit you. We can't win the wall out shooting war. But if it comes down to it, we can raise enough hell to force them to the negotiating table. But no matter what happens, this second-class citizenship is over with. By the time this is done, a lot of us will most likely be dead. Depending on how things shake out, who's ever left is going to either be a slave or a buffalo soldier. He thought their blank stares stemmed from their contemplation of death. Then, Rooster asked, what's a buffalo soldier? Oh, shit. Well, fellas, let me tell you a little story. A subtle pride slipped into his tone when he began reciting the tale like an old western campfire story. In September 1867, Private John Randall, Troop G of the all-black 10th Cavalry Regiment out of Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, was assigned to escort two bigwood civilians on a hunting trip. Because Private John Randall was a hell of a marksman, good at his job. Anyway, they're out on the Kansas Plains doing their thing, when all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a band of Cheyennes swooped down on them. Had they been about 70 of them, Randall and them was caught totally off guard, and before they even know what's happening, BAM! Both civilians dead in George Washington. So now, old Randall, getting the ripping and running first this way and that, all the time firing his rifle like a gathering gun, when booyah, his horse gets shot right out from under him. Now he's in the dirt, scrambling and scraping in the dust, trying to get some kind of cover, somehow managed to wriggle up in a washout under some railroad tracks. For more than an hour, them Cheyenne charged him over and over. They threw everything they had at the boy. He had sweat and blood dripping off from him everywhere, flying everywhere. But he tied off his wounds and he kept on fighting. By the time help finally arrived, poor Randall had killed 13 Cheyenne. The Cheyenne had shot the boy once in the shoulder and wounded him 11 times by lance. When asked about the dark-skinned warrior, Cheyenne said the more you hurt him, the matter he got. When asked to describe him, they said he was black as coal with thick shaggy hair and fought like a cornered buffalo. By the time Hawk finished the story, you could have lit a fire by the light in Rooster's eyes. That John Randall is seriously a practical man. Buffalo me up like a muddy fucker. Something about Rooster's unbridled enthusiasm was contagious. The Hispanics caught it right away. Maybe it was because they'd soon be blood brothers in a very real sense. Maybe it was the hope that sometimes, under the right circumstances, you could actually beat the odds. He didn't know the reason. But in some transitional way, a camaraderie that had seemed impossible a minute ago was now permeating the room. Nestor suddenly piped up. Hey, Ward! He pointed to a young banger who lounged back in his chair. That's Marty! The kid smiled and waved. Marty like car! Not wanting to alienate his new alliances, but also not wanting to be overly familiar, Hawk spoke flatly. Sounds like a conversation for another time. Okay, but since we are buddy-buddy now, I just thought you might want to meet the guy who stole your cobra. Marty sprang up from the chair. Imitating a burnout, he screeched. <coughs> Shifting air gears, he whooped it up. <coughs> The room erupted, and Hawk called for food. Danny admitted he'd been responsible for the pod doors being opened. Some of the guards, whose families had indeed been threatened, had done it. Danny's sphere of influence proved larger than Hawk had realized. Even without the full support of the rank and file, he'd been able to coordinate an impressive operation. But why had Reyes so readily given Danny carte blanche over this most potent force in the penal system? Danny explained. We discussed what was happening and what needed to happen in response. We came up with some ideas. 
He's doing life. He wants his name to live forever. All right, so what are the group's goals? Long range? To build a base across all the Americas, strong enough to protect poor people's interests over the entire continent. But where we are at this moment is a reactionary response to what's actually going on here. We couldn't wait. We had to do something now. And that is, you do what you know. Reyes knows how to street fight. I know how to weaponize code. He had the muscle, I had the technical expertise. Like I said, we didn't choose the time. It chose us. Ours is a defensive posture. So what's the plan? To organize, unite working people. No, that's the goal. What's the plan? Old school guerrilla tactics, general strikes, paper terrorism, and how do you deal with the military? Hit and run, small groups, scattered cells. We aren't looking for overnight success, like I said. We have to start somewhere, so we start where we are.